I'm Steve Clements. I direct the American Strategy Program at the New America Foundation and write a blog called The Washington Note. I'm here with my friend Bart Gelman, who's written uh, a fantastic book uh, with which uh, I think one cannot understand uh, the Bush administration without reading titled Angler, the Cheney Vice Presidency. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, you. You've just given a talk. And I just want to ask you, I mean, what should Americans take from this this chronicle of Vice President Cheney and his team? What should they worry about? What, what, did, you, what did you find so shocking as you were getting into this, this story? Well, you know, the Constitution has one uh, direct and one implied power for the Vice President, the direct one being to break tie votes in the Senate, and the implied one uh, that your job is to uh, keep reading in case the President stops. And it would have been ludicrous any other time to think uh, about how do you devise a mechanism for holding the vice president accountable. And yet Cheney has raised that issue because he was as near a thing to a deputy president as we've ever had. So much of what he did was invisible by design. And because of that, it was very hard to, to uh, hold accountable either the vice president or the president for what they were doing. You know, when I, when I look at the Bush team and I look at President Bush himself, you know, I don't know how George Bush makes a decision. I don't know whether he talks to God, talks to sort of advisors. Um, Condi Rice seemed to have five or six followers. Colin Powell seemed to matter when he was in the room and not when he wasn't in the room. But Dick Cheney seemed to have this ability. He had people throughout the national security bureaucracy and they sort of thought like he did. So while he did do explicit things, the other thing is he had an ability to put people into government who sort of thought the Cheney way. What do you think the implications are for that for Barack Obama? Because I don't know how Barack Obama makes a decision or what, what he's about. And do you think that, that we've seen you know, an era where, where people in various roles of government can come along and hijack it by simply telegraphing how they approach you know, national security questions or economic questions or policy challenges? Cheney is a singular figure. And the relationship between Cheney and Bush is a singular relationship uh, between uh, experience and inexperience, also between a guy who likes to make broad, visionary uh, decisions about goals. We're not going to coddle terrorists anymore, for example. And a guy who understands that almost all the important decisions about power are in details, are in the, where the ends and the means collide. And, you know, we all want prosperity and peace, uh, but how do you get there? And Bush lost interest pretty early in the uh, sort of in in the tra travel from goals to implementing details. Cheney was the master of those things. I think that Obama shows some signs of being as hungry for information as Cheney was, mm -hmm. and it remains to be seen whether he has the executive uh, instinct whether he understands what to delegate, what not to, what to pay attention to, what not to, uh, how to find and inspire allies, because the president cannot do most of what he does by command alone. He's got to lead people to want to do, want to go toward his goals, and he's got to find the effective ones and distinguish them from the ones who are all talk and no action. And the thing about Cheney was that he went straight to the pivot point in the bureaucracy. He knew exactly where to change a phrase or a sentence and just shift the course of the nation. And you need people like that to make your agenda happen. Did you learn to admire any part of Dick Cheney as you were writing this book? There's a lot to admire about Cheney. He is a guy who was truly devoted to serving this country as he saw it. He was a guy who kept to his principles as he saw them. He sacrificed his health. He sacrificed quite a bit of money because notwithstanding the easy claims about Halliburton enriching himself, enriching friends, they're just not true. He, uh, he actually gave up four or five million dollars in stock options he could have kept under federal ethics rules uh, just before assuming the vice presidency. And he is so secretive and so indifferent to what we think of him that he never let anyone know. <laughs> what do you think are his worst qualities? I think that the most troubling thing about the Cheney vice presidency was a sort of uh, a quest for power without limit, a belief that he understood the threats to the nation and the required responses so much more clearly than others did, and that public opinion was so incoherent and feckless and ill-informed that he should seek for himself and for the president very nearly unlimited 
authority, that no branch of government, that no concerns about public opinion, that no diplomatic overtures from allies should sway the United States from doing as it thought best. And by it, he meant uh, the guy sitting in the Oval Office. Well, I want to thank Bart Gelman for being with us. Um, you won the Pulitzer Prize for your exposés that you did on this, and the New York Times has picked this as one of its notable books of the year. I've read it, reviewed it. I think it's an extraordinary chronicle that, that, that just one must read to understand this presidency uh, that we've just uh, worked through. So thanks very much for being with us. Thank you, Steve.